Uh, so yeah, in, in this talk, I want to uh, discuss the, the accuracy of numerical algorithms. Uh, and as the title says, in, in the particular context of uh, the solution of large scale problems, and possibly with the use of uh, low precision arithmetics. Uh, and I guess for that, I, I need first to explain why uh, in this setting, uh, we might uh, be worried about the accuracy of, of numerical algorithms. Um, and so, uh, as you know, in, in finite precision computations, uh, we have uh, to deal with rounding errors and specifically uh, when working uh, with floating point arithmetic, which I'm, I'm going to focus on. Uh, we have this, this model here, which says that uh, the elementary operations that are the addition, uh, subtraction, multiplication and division of two scalar uh, quantities uh, produce a rounding error delta, which is bounded by a quantity u, which is called the unit round off and which depends on the precision of the arithmetic. Uh, but this is, of course, only true for these four elementary operations. Once we start uh, combining several operations together in, in complex computations, rounding errors, unfortunately, uh, tend to accumulate. And just to illustrate this with a simple example, if we, if we look at the inner product of two vectors in R3, we're going to do uh, three multiplications and two additions. So we're going to produce five rounding errors, delta 1 through delta 5. Uh, which are going to be combined in, in certain ways. And an elegant way to, to, to express this is to rewrite the computed inner product S hat as uh, an exact inner product uh, of the original components of the X and Y vectors perturbed by a number of uh, error terms, uh, which are in blue here. So this is called a backward error bound. Uh, which expresses the computed result as uh, an exact computation of perturbed data. So here we have a perturbation on, on the vector x uh, called delta x. We could have written this with a perturbation on y, uh, that, would be, that would be the same thing. And so as you can see now, if we're interested in, in bounding uh, the size of this perturbation delta x, we need to uh, determine how big these products uh, in blue can get. So as you can see, we have a, an expression of the form uh, you know, product of one plus delta k uh, terms. Um, and so to do this, we have a very fundamental lemma in, in backward error analysis, which is extremely useful, which bounds by how much uh, the, the product of n terms of the form one plus delta, where delta is bounded by u, uh, can deviate from one. And so the lemma says that it cannot deviate from one uh, by more than the quantity bounded by a constant uh, called gamma n. And this constant gamma n is uh, well, quite famous in rounding error analysis. I mean, it's, um, as you can see, proportional to n nu. So to first order, it's, it's equal to n nu. Uh, and so we, in this case, uh, for example, the delta x is therefore bounded by gamma 3. So we have five rounding errors, but there's only three, at most three rounding errors that, that propagate uh, on any given component of the original inner prop. Uh, and of course, that's because the uh, vectors are in R3. If we now take an inner product in, a, in Rn, then we will be, uh, we'll have a backward error bound, which is uh, bounded by gamma n. And, and importantly, this is also true for many other types of computations, especially in, in linear algebra. Uh, like matrix vector products or the factorization of matrices, the solution of linear systems, and so on. So we have this gamma n constant that is a little bit everywhere in, in linear algebra. And so this answers the, the first question, why should we worry about uh, the accuracy of numerical algorithms? Well, uh, we see here that in principle, the error can grow as uh, n mu. Um, so of course, whether that is a problem or not is going to depend on what values of n and u we, we have. So starting with u, historically, most of the computations um, in, in scientific computing were done in either double or single precision, uh, which, uh, for which the unit round of u is equal to uh, about 10 to the minus 16 and 10 to the minus 8, respectively. So these are fairly small values of u, but uh, recently uh, there are lower precisions that have been uh, emerging on, on modern hardware, and in particular, Half precision arithmetic is now um, uh, widely supported through the use of two uh, formats that are different, FP16 and BFLOAT16. And as you can see in the table, these formats have a unit round of which is much larger, of about 10 to minus 4 or 10 to minus 3. 
So if we consider an error of order uh, n mu, uh, this error is going to exceed one uh, for relatively modest values of n, uh, about a few thousands in FP16 or even a few hundreds in FP16. So for relatively small problems, uh, this error bound is, is saying that we cannot guarantee anything uh, about the accuracy of the computation. So clearly, we should worry when using half precision. Uh, but what about even higher precisions, like, like single precision? Uh, in this case, the answer is going to depend on, on how large can n get. And here, a little bit of historical perspective is, is relevant, uh, because when backward error analysis was originally developed uh, by uh, James Wilkinson in the, in the 60s, the typical values of, of n were quite small. For example, solving a, a linear system of order 100 would have been considered a, a huge task. And for this reason, uh, the problem dimension n was often called uh, a constant. In the, in the rounding error analysis, we, we often uh, call these, these uh, variables that depend on the problem dimension as, as constants. And for this reason, uh, there's not been much work in uh, well, studying and, and paying attention to, this, uh, to the value of these constants in the bound. Uh, but that was in the 60s, and since then, of course, the problem dimensions that we, that we have to deal with have, have significantly uh, increased. As an example, if we look at the top 500 ranking, which ranks the uh, most powerful supercomputers in the world, the number one computer in the latest ranking uh, is, uh, is there at top, on the top of the ranking uh, because it has solved the linear system of 21 uh, million equations. So that's a very large value of n. And the important thing is that to appear on the ranking, the, the computer has to pass an accuracy check. Uh, and it did that. So it did not run into any uh, accuracy problems. And so you may think that this example of 21 million equation is just for the you know, supercomputer ranking. And then in practice, the problems are, are typically much smaller. But that, that would not be entirely true. Uh, we do routinely sol uh, solve and, and face uh, large problems. Uh, and for example, here, I, I give an example of three applications that I've personally uh, had the, the, the chance to, uh, to work with uh, in, in the context of my, of my work in the multifrontal solver MUMS. So here, these are sparse problems. So the error doesn't grow as n u, but just as n to the power two thirds u, but it's, it's still a significant growth. And as you can see, for these problems, we are dealing with uh, hundreds of millions of unknowns. Uh, and again, all these problems were solved accurately. We didn't run into any issues. Uh, even for those that were using uh, single precision. So the question is why? Why are uh, these results surprisingly accurate or more accurate than, than what could be expected from the bound? Uh, and this question has been, uh, you know, has been tackled already since almost the, the beginning of, the, of digital computing by, by several researchers. Essentially, the, the intuition is that a new, we have to remember, is a worst case bound. And this worst case is attained when all the rounding errors go in the same direction, essentially when they're all equal to either plus u or minus u. But of course, in practice, we, we don't have any reason to think that is going to be the case. We, we might hope that roughly half the rounding errors will be uh, negative and half will be positive, And so they are somewhat going to cancel each other. And so to translate this intuition, there's a number of, of researchers, uh, starting with uh, von Neumann and, and Goldstein, that have tried to model the rounding errors as random variables. And from this line of, uh, of work, uh, there's uh, been a rule of thumb that has been uh, stated by Wilkinson and that has become very famous, which says that uh, the, the bound n nu can be replaced by square root of n. So we don't have a linear growth of the error, just uh, something that grows as square root of n. Now, but this is called a rule of thumb and not a rule. It's not an actual theorem. And since the 60s, it, that situation hasn't really changed. And there's three main reasons why that is. The first is that probabilistic analyses uh, historically have, have lacked uh, rigorous uh, results. Uh, often uh, they were first order analysis with um, neglecting second order error terms. Um, there were many uh, asymptotic assumptions on the, on the problem dimension. For example, some results would be stated for sufficiently large n, but without really knowing what sufficiently large means. 
And these are probabilistic results. So they hold with, with certain probability, but the probability wasn't really known. Uh, you would typically see sentences like, this result is true with high probability, but again, we don't know what high probability means. So that's the first limitation, uh, not, not really rigorous theorem that is um, you know, given a, a specific bound that we can trust. The second limitation is that uh, early analyses were not very general. They were in general um, specific to uh, some algorithm or some very specific computation. And just as an example, we, we didn't have uh, an analog of the fundamental lemma of backward analysis, but in a, in a probabilistic framework. Uh, and finally, the, the third limitation is that early probabilistic analysis uh, actually failed to explain many things. And there were many, well, results or observations that were just unexplained uh, at the time until recently. And I, I just want to give a few examples of that. So uh, what I'm going to do is uh, show some experimental results with inner products of dimension n. And so I've already said that the, the worst case bound here is, is gamma n. And I'm going to compare this bound to the actual true backward error that we can compute, and which is given by, by this formula here in red. And so let's do this first for um, an inner product in single precision with random vectors whose entries are, are sampled from the uniform uh, zero one uh, distribution. And so what you can see here in blue is the, is the backward error as a function of n on the x axis. And indeed here we see that it grows uh, as square root of n u. So here the, the rule of thumb uh, is a very good prediction of what actually happens, but that's not always the case. For example, if we switch not to, from single to half precision, now we have a different result in that for large n, the probabilistic rule of thumb is not true anymore. It's not a, it's not a rule. And in fact, we see that the error kind of explodes and, and quickly reaches the, the worst case error bound, which is about one for large n. Um, and so that's for vectors in, uh, with entries in zero one, but what about you know, if we switch that to minus one one entries, then we get yet another type of result. Here, the backward error uh, does not grow anymore. It seems to be independent of them. Um, and that means that even the probabilistic bound is, is being pessimistic here. And we don't really uh, know why. And I want to show a last experiment where we use something called tensor cores, which is a special type of, of uh, units that are available on, on the modern uh, GPUs. So these units are uh, intrinsically mixed precision. So what they do is they represent the data in FP16, so in half precision, but all the internal computations on this data are, is done in higher uh, single precision. So because of that, the, the error bound for, for an inner product, for example, is not uh, anymore just n times the precision, but there's two terms, a constant term that depends on the half precision unit round of uh, U16, and then a term that grows linearly with n that depends on the single precision uh, unit round. So what we would expect uh, from this is that we would expect the error to be well constant uh, as long as the first term dominates. And then for very large n, when the second th term starts to dominate, the error would start to increase, right? That's, that's what we would expect. But we get something that is quite different. Uh, we get a backward error that decreases as n increases. So I guess a backward error that stays constant might be something we, we can maybe accept, even though we don't understand it, but the backward error that decreases with the problem size, that, that has to be really strange, right? So, so that's what I mean with this third limitation. There's so many things that the early analysis failed to explain. And so today I, I want to review some recent work that we've done with Nick Hyam on uh, improving these early uh, analysis by essentially uh, overcoming these uh, three limitations. And so we specifically have two papers. The first one is from about two years ago in which we did the first uh, backward error analysis in a probabilistic framework. And that assumed that the rounding errors are independent random variables. And a second paper, which is really the, the follow-up of the first and which is the, the object of uh, well, the, the, the prize. And um, in which we do a number of improvements uh, First, we, we drop this independence assumption, which as I'll explain, is not really realistic. Uh, and then there's a number of uh, experiments that, um, and explanations and new insights that we get. And, and we are able to explain all the previous uh, figures that I've shown. 
Um, so, okay, starting with um, the, the, the first probabilistic backorder analysis, we're going to work uh, with a model on the run years that I'm going to call model N. And uh, this model uh, is going to assume two things about the run years, um, that they are um, independent random variables and that uh, they have a mean of zero. So their expected value is zero. And under this model, uh, we proved essentially an analog of the fundamental lemma that you saw at the beginning, but uh, in a probabilistic framework. So we bound um, by how much the product of n terms of the form one plus delta k can deviate from one. And we say that it cannot deviate from one by more than a quantity bounded by gamma lambda square root of n. So previously we had gamma n, now we have replaced n by lambda times square root of n. So we have a square root of n error growth. And this lambda in front of the constant is uh, the parameter that controls with which probability this result holds. So it's a probabilistic result, and it's true with the probability p lambda, which as you can see, uh, goes to one at an exponential rate when we increase lambda. So what that means is that for very small lambda, this probability is already going to be very close to one. So there's a number of reasons we are uh, happy with this result. It has a number of key features. First, as you may see, there is no big O of u square anywhere or anything like that. It's, it's a bound that is perfectly rigorous and, and valid to, to any order. There's no assumption on, on n. Uh, n doesn't have to be you know, large enough for this result to be true. Uh, so it's not an asymptotic result. And we have an explicit probability uh, with which the result holds. Um, I should mention that it's actually quite pessimistic and that in practice, taking lambda equal to one is, is in general sufficient for the bound to hold. But nevertheless, uh, at least we, we have an explicit bound on, on the probability. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, this is an extremely general result because it doesn't bound the error for a specific algorithm. It works on an abstract term that is the product of, of one plus delta case. And therefore, um, we can apply it in a very systematic way. So essentially, if you take any backorder bound from the standard rounding error analysis that has gamma n, uh, which is most of the bounds, uh, you can just replace that by gamma lambda square root of n and get a probabilistic error bound. And so for example, here you see the probabilistic bounds for all the algorithms that I've uh, previously mentioned. So just quickly go back to some of the experiments I, I've shown. Now we, we can compare the actual backward error to this new gamma, uh, gamma lambda square root of n for lambda equal one here. And so as we saw for uh, for single precision inner product with vectors in, in zero one, uh, our probabilistic bound is, is sharp. So that's uh, very good. And I should mention that that is the most typical result. So now I, I'm going to focus a lot on, on some of the uh, limit cases and strange behaviors, but this is what most of the time happens. Um, so now what if we switch to half precision? Um, so in this case, the, the gamma square root of n bound is true for you know, small n, but at some point it stops being true and the error explodes as we, as we saw. So here, uh, what happens is that the model underlying the uh, bound, so the model n is broken after a, a certain while. So in fact, we have vectors with uh, entries in zero one, so with non-negative entries, which means that we are, we are summing only non-negative numbers. And so the, the sum keeps increasing. And for large n, at some point, it's going to become so large that subsequent increments are not going to change its value in floating point arithmetic. And so uh, that's something that we've called stagnation because what happens is that the, the sum for large n just keeps stagnating to the same value. And so we keep adding small increments that are just ignored and we keep rounding down. So why does that break the model? The reason is, as I've said, we keep rounding down. So if we round always in the same direction, the rounding errors are all going to be of the same sign. So clearly model M cannot, cannot hold. So this is the issue here. And we'll come back to this figure in a while. But first, um, I think what this experiment illustrates is that uh, model M is not very realistic. 
and uh, it can be broken easily. And in particular, there is this independence assumption in model M, which, well, which is just wrong because in fact, we know for a fact that rounding errors are not independent. If we do just a sequence of, of operations, the, the rounding errors towards the end of the computation depend on the previous rounding errors because that, that is going to affect the, the actual result. Uh, so that is what we set out to improve in the, in the second paper. We wanted to, to make the model more realistic. And, uh, and so we, we use the following model, which I'm going to call N prime, which we, we drop this independence assumption and we, we allow the running errors to now be possibly dependent. We require only something that is called mean independence, which is a weaker assumption than independence, and which is essentially what you can see here in red. So what we are saying is that the expectation of delta k conditioned by the previous running errors is equal to the unconditional expectation of delta k, which is zero by assumption. So a conditional expectation intuitively, that means that if we know, or if we fix, if we remove the randomness for the first k minus one running errors, and we just ask, you know, what can we expect from delta k, the kth running, running error? Well, the fact that we fixed the first k minus one hasn't changed anything. So it's still going to be the same, which we assume to be zero. And so importantly, dropping independence doesn't matter. And we were able in, in the second paper to prove that um, the probabilistic lemma remains, uh, remains true. So we, we still have a error growth of order uh, square root of n uh, with model n prime. And I, I want to quickly give an overview of how we, we go about proving that. And what the main tool that we use is called the Martingale. It's a tool from probability theory. Um, so Martingale is just a sequence of random variables that satisfies two properties, uh, boundedness or, or finiteness, uh, which in the case of rounding errors is obviously satisfied since they are bounded. And the second and, and most important property is that the conditional expectation of uh, at step k plus one of this sequence, given the first k steps, is going to be the previous step, sk. Um, I'll explain an intuitive uh, interpretation of what this means on the next slide. But first, just let's look at why we, we want to use these martingales. We want them because we can then use a very useful uh, concentration inequality uh, called Azuma Höfting that takes a martingale, S0 through Sn, uh, such that the difference between two consecutive steps in this sequence is bounded by some constant c. And if that's the case, then we can bound the difference between the first step as zero and the last step or the nth step uh, as n. And it happens to be bounded by um, square root of n c times a small multiple lambda, which again controls the probability with which the result holds. So this is where the square root of n is going to come from in our bounds and we're going to use this inequality. So in fact, the proof is, is actually quite short. What we want is to, is to bound the products, uh, well, the deviation from one of the product of n terms, one plus, uh, plus delta k. So uh, what we, we are going to do is prove that this sequence, the products of the delta of the one plus delta k is a martingale. And this is actually just a, a almost immediate consequence of what we've assumed in, in model M prime, the, the mean independence of the delta i's. So once with that, uh, we just have to, to notice that the two consecutive um, steps in, in that martingale uh, is of course bounded because we are just adding one more one plus delta term, which is bounded. Uh, and therefore this is where we, we get our, our bound. So the technical details are, are not very interesting, but we, we, we obtain a, a gamma lambda square root of n after a, a few computations. So I guess that's the, the mathematical and rigorous part, but maybe you're asking for, for an interpretation of this. What, what, what does it mean that the running errors are mean independent? And, and you know, why are we using this martingale uh, theory? It might seem a little bit mysterious. So I like to, to explain this with one random walks because random walks are actually uh, one of the simplest examples of uh, martingales. In fact, uh, so as you probably know, a random walk, it's a sequence um, where, or a stochastic process where at each um, iteration, we're going to take a step 
in a random direction, and we have the same chance of going in any direction. So clearly, if we look at the sequence of the positions, uh, these are not independent because the position has to take uh, k plus one is obviously going to depend uh, on where we were at the previous step. But um, because we have an identical chance of going in either direction, um, the unexpected value, the position at step k plus one would be to just stay where we are. So where we were at uh, step uh, sk. So clearly um, that's a martingale. And so essentially what model m prime is saying is that finite precision computations are a sort of random walks. If we interpret running errors as steps that we take in some direction, clearly what we've done before, the errors that we've uh, produced before is going to affect where we end up and therefore our, our, uh, they are not independent. However, if we assume at any given operation, so at any given step, that in expectation, the error uh, is going to be zero, then um, that is what model M prime assumes and that is a marking. And so why, why is this mean independence and this marking uh, thing uh, important? Uh, that's because it's a much weaker assumption that independence that can actually uh, hold in practice. And uh, how do we make it hold? Well, there is a thing called stochastic rounding. Stochastic rounding is also a very old idea, but this is something that has known renewed interest recently because of this probabilistic analysis. So how, how does that work? Well, when we need to round a number to on the floating point interval, so we're uh, either going to round it up or down. Uh, and of course, the default mode that uh, I've been using so far is round to nearest. We'll round x to the nearest of the two endpoints of the interval. So here, for example, on the figure, we would round up. Stochastic rounding does something different. It's going to round randomly, either up or down, with a given probability. And what's really important is that this probability is a function of the distance of x to the two endpoints of the interval. Specifically, the probability is given as 1 minus the relative distance of x to the, uh, each endpoint. So in other words, if we are closer to um, the uh, next floating point value, we have a greater chance of rounding there. However, we still have a non-zero probability of rounding in the other direction, and therefore uh, we have a potentially uh, less accurate rounding. So in fact, all the backward error bounds with stochastic rounding uh, hold with, uh, by replacing u with 2u. But what is really important about stochastic rounding, and that we proved in, in a recent paper with, with Michael Connolly and, and Nick Hyam, is that the rounding errors that are produced by this stochastic rounding satisfy model n prime. So the assumptions underlying our probabilistic analysis are enforced by the use of stochastic rounding. And so the probabilistic square root of n bound is now a well, it's not anymore a rule of thumb, but it's an actual rule. And I want to illustrate this by uh, coming back to the example that we saw previously with um, inner products and stagnation. Uh, so in half precision, as you remember, the with round to nearest, at some point the error uh, explodes um, because it breaks model M prime. But with stochastic rounding, we, we are able to, to avoid that. Uh, in fact, stochastic rounding is immune to stagnation. Uh, and so the reason is that um, with stagnation, what was happening is that the next increments were too small to actually increase the, to actually round up. But with stochastic rounding, we still have a chance of rounding up. It's a small chance, but if we keep adding small increments, at some point we're going to round up. And in fact, uh, here, um, the, the results are, are therefore um, significantly more accurate for large n. And we believe this explains why stochastic rounding has found a, a renewed interest and, and, and high success in, in some applications, um, such as machine learning or, or also more recently PDEs. So now that we've gone on, on this stagnation thing, I, I want to go back to one of the mysterious experiments we, we saw at the beginning, where the fact of switching from random vectors in 0, 1 to random vectors in minus 1, 1 changes the error completely. And here, uh, as you've seen, the backward error does not depend on n, it does not grow at all, and it seems to stay constant. So initially, we suspected that 
the, the case in zero one, um, because it has only positive elements, is maybe too special. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, we were wrong. And we, we realized this while working on the, on the second paper by, by trying vectors uh, with elements in minus one, two. And um, as you can see here with these elements, which uh, there are both negative and positive, we have an error that looks uh, quite similar to the uh, zero, zero one case. So that's not the answer. And in fact, um, it is the minus one one vectors that is a special case. So what does it have that is so special? Well, it's an interval that is centered around zero. So that means that the data that we're using has a mean of zero. So why, why is this uh, having such a big uh, effect on the error? Well, first, intuitively, uh, you need to recall that the backward error is a uh, is proportional to the to the difference between the computed inner product and the exact inner product and there's a standard rounding error bound on, on that quantity which is given by well using model and prime we have a square root and growth times u times the maximum um, value of uh, the sks where the sks are the partial inner products so we, the error is proportional to the maximum value that the inner products is going to take during the computation. In general, well, if we have only non-negative entries, the inner products, the partial inner products keep increasing. And so the maximum value is just the final inner product. But in general, of course, we, we don't have only non-negative elements. We may, might have something called cancellation where the final inner product in absolute value might be much smaller than the intermediate values that the computation has taken. And in fact, in general, without making any assumptions on the data, the best bound that, that we have is uh, to bound this by the uh, inner product of the absolute value of the vectors. But this is a perhaps too general bound. And the question is, what if we specialize it to the case of random uniform vectors? So if we have a distribution in zero one, it's quite easy to see that the partial uh, product is just going to be increasing linearly with n. In fact, it should be about n over 2, more or less. However, if uh, we have uh, an interval in minus 1, 1, because the, the, the x, i, and y, i have a zero mean, the value of the inner products is going to be much smaller. And we can uh, prove that by similar statistical effects as what we've seen uh, until now, in fact, the value of the inner product is only going to be uh, of order square root of n. So as a consequence, uh, the backward error for uh, zero mean data is reduced by a factor of square root of n. So since we had a bound, a probabilistic bound of order square root of n to begin with, we are just left with a constant term. So this is kind of an intuition. And we came up with a more uh, rigorous and, and sophisticated model to explain this properly. Um, so it, it is what I'm calling model M double prime, which is just, just an extension of model M prime, where we also add some assumptions on the data, on the vectors. So we assume that we are dealing with an inner product of uh, random independent vectors of a certain distribution whose mean uh, is uh, mu and uh, where the entries are, are bounded, essentially. Um, and so for this type of uh, data, we have the following a sharper backward error bound, where we can bound the backward error by um, well, the quantity here uh, that, that is essentially determined by the red uh, numerator. So you can see we have two, um, two terms. The first term grows as a square root of n, but in front of it, there is mu, the mean of the, of the entries of the vectors. So if that is zero, this term disappears, and we are only left with the second term, which as you can see is constant. So this explains um, the, the result that, that we are observing. Um, and that's not the only thing that uh, this explains. It also happens to explain the results that we saw with tensor cores. So as you remember, with tensor cores, that might have been the, the most surprising of the experiments where we had an error that was decreasing. Uh, and in fact, by, by a similar analysis, which I'm not going to detail because it's slightly technical, but by a similar analysis, we can express the, the backward error bound as a function of, of the elements uh, of x and y. So we are trying now to take into account the specific data that we have. And if we do that, we can actually prove that the backward error 
is smaller than the unit round of half precision divided by square root of n plus the other term that depends on the single precision and that grows linearly with n. So that, that explains why for not too large n, that is where the first term dominates, we're going to see an error that decreases. So here, what we would expect is that if we keep increasing n, at some point, the second term, which is n u32, is going to start dominating and we will see the error going back up. But we, we didn't have the computational resources to, to test that theory. So I, I want to conclude with uh, an idea. So what we saw is that um, the, uh, using data that is centered around zero, that has zero mean, uh, can reduce the, the backward error quite significantly by up to a factor of square root of n. So, so a natural idea is to, is to ask whether we, we can take advantage of this. So specifically, if we are given vectors whose mean is not zero, so some mean mu, can we maybe shift them to make them uh, zero mean. So for example, let's let's shift uh, x in the inner product by mu and then compute this shifted inner product and then add back what we've taken out. So adding n times mu to the final result. So mathematically, uh, this is strictly equivalent, of course, but in floating point arithmetic, because of this probabilistic analysis that we've seen, we might expect that we are going to reduce the backward error. And in fact, we can guarantee a backward error of order a constant. There is also an, an economical perspective here. Uh, economically, shifting the vector is, is, is quite expensive with respect to the cost of computing the inner product. But that's only for just one inner product. What if we need to perform many inner products like in a square matrix matrix product? In this case, the shift cost is of order uh, n square operations whereas the matrix matrix uh, product cost is of order n cube. So for large n, asymptotically, the cost of shifting uh, the matrices to have zero mean elements is negligible. And we have an algorithm that we, that we expect to be uh, economically attractive and much more accurate. And so these are uh, the results that, that we obtain. So uh, in blue, you can see the standard uh, error, which grows as square root of n at least, or maybe worse if we have stagnation as on the right figure. And in red, you see the shifted algorithm, which uh, benefits from the favorable uh, backward error bound of zero mean data, and is therefore able to, to maintain a much more accurate result. <clears throat> so wrapping up, I guess the conclusion of uh, this talk can really be summarized in just one line. Um, Anywhere in, in backward error analysis where we have gamma n, which grows as uh, n mu, we can replace it by uh, gamma lambda square root of n and obtain a probabilistic, much sharper uh, error bound that uh, holds with a certain probability. Uh, thanks to that, we are able to provide some uh, guarantees on the accuracy of computations in a large scale or low precision setting. Uh, and that's very good if we're willing to accept one, that these are probabilistic guarantees, and two, that there are some underlying assumptions. And what's really important, in my opinion, is that these assumptions can be enforced by the use of stochastic run. And the second um, big uh, point here about probabilistic analysis is, is not just that they provide better guarantees, but also that they provide a lot of new insights into the behavior of numerical computations. And there's lots of things that we previously did not understood, understand and that we were unable to explain that um, probabilistic analysis are really able to, to, to explain almost, almost perfectly. Um, I, I've talked about stagnation, the effect of rounding modes, the mean of the data. So all of these things are, are now things that we, that we understand. But I want to conclude by, by something that we do not understand. There is still some, some questions, and specifically uh, the LDU factorization of matrices. That's another, of course, very important uh, kernel algorithm, and it has a lot of inner products in there. So we, we might hope that we can benefit from, from this work on, on, on inner products. And I should mention that, of course, the gamma square root of n bound holds because that's, that's a very general bound, um, but it, it therefore predicts a growth of the error as square root of n. And if we look at the inner products, they don't have zero mean. In fact, they're not random. So we, we don't have any reason to expect that the error should not grow as square root of n. Uh, 
Uh, and yet, this is what happens if we perform the experiment. We see that the error does not grow as quarter time. It seems to stay almost constant. And that's something that we do not, how, do not know how to explain. So that concludes my talk. And thank you. And I'll be happy to answer uh, questions. Thank you so much, Theo, for a really uh, intriguing talk. And uh, you've already triggered uh, quite a few questions in uh, the panel. But uh, before I hand over the word to our first uh, uh, panel member, uh, can I just please remind everyone to uh, put questions into the Q&A boxes if you uh, want to ask them. So Aria, please. Yes. So I have two questions. First of all, uh, some elements here and the idea behind it. And by the way, this was really a fantastic talk and great results. It reminded me somewhat of smooth error analysis of Danny Spielman and others. Uh, do you know about it and do you know what are the connections? And I'll ask also a second question in the same go, namely, the, the coolest element here, as far as I'm concerned, was the connection with mountain gears. But we know that mountain gears in the limit can be solved by differential equations. Say the, the example you gave, you know, the random walk in 2D essentially is being, can be solved by the Laplace equation. Or a Laplace equation is the limit of the solution when the number, the size of steps tends to zero. So can one use this sort of connection to derive further results on backward error analysis? I'm not sure I understand your second comment. So the first, unfortunately, I, I'm not familiar with the, the smooth analysis you mentioned, so I, I cannot comment. Uh, I'm not sure I understood the second comment. Uh, what do you mean by uh, that martingales are solved by the Laplace equation? Well, when you take, for example, the 2D martingale on this, uh, in this slide, then essentially, it, if you sample in two dimensions, mountain, uh, random walk always reaches a boundary. If you put it in a box, it will always reach the boundary of the box. If you sample it at the boundary, whenever it reaches it, and you have an infinite number of mounting yields evolving from a point, and you are taking the expectation of reaching different points on the boundary, essentially you obtain an approximation to the solution of the Laplace equation with this boundary condition. Okay. So there is this sort of strange connection between random walks, martingales, and differential and elliptic differential equations. And this might be an interesting insight into our analysis. So I assume this means that the, the behavior of finite precision computations in the limit behaves like a Laplace equation. Uh, Something like that, that yes. That is a, a very, yeah, very deep insight. I'm not sure if there's any, uh, any way of taking advantage of that from a theoretical or practical point of view. I'll have to, to think about that. Definitely interesting links here. Thanks a lot, uh, Aria, for mentioning this. Um, now I hand over to Des, please. Hey, thank you, Theo. Thanks for that talk. Um, just a, a quick question. You, these assumptions seem perfectly reasonable, but can you actually test them? You know, there are ways of testing whether a set of samples are independent. So have you tested whether M prime and M double prime seem to hold in practice? Uh, yeah, we, we tried that. Um, we didn't really focus so much about the independence, but about the mean zero. That seemed the, maybe the easier one to test. Um, and the issue is that we have to go to very large sizes to actually um, be able to, to determine whether uh, the mean is zero. Because if, if we just sample, I don't know, a billion running errors and you compute their, their mean, that's never going to be exactly zero. And it, it converges at a rate that is, if I'm not mistaken, the square root of the, the sample size, the inverse of the square root. So, I mean, to reach something that would be close to zero, you will need a huge sample size. So we're, we're limited here by, by practical 
resource. I'd be, I'd be more interested in the, in the independent assumption. I know there are statistical tools, but they're, they're all based on certain assumptions, of course, but you can in principle say whether this bunch of numbers seems to be from an independent set of samples. We didn't, we didn't try that. No. Okay. Okay, thank you, Des. Uh, Derek. Okay, hi. Uh, yes, thank you for your talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, so my question is related to Gupta's paper that you mentioned, uh, where stochastic grounding is used in training neural networks. Um, so recently, in a lot of applications, it's become popular to go even further and just round to the set minus one and one. Uh, so a lot of times people will take the gradient and then just take the sign of the gradient, multiply it by like a constant step size. And this is very successful in a lot of different applications. And so I'm wondering if your results can shed any light um, as to why this would work for training these networks. Yes, I think the basic idea is the same. Um, and here, this is half precision. So of course we have a, a few more than just two uh, states, but um, the, yeah, binary neural networks are just pushing these to the, to the, to the extreme. So I think that the same kind of, um, of mechanics is, is at play here, so. Oh, so maybe I should clarify. So the, it's not a binary neural network. It's, um, so we're operating in R, but we just take the sign of the gradient and uh, assuming there's a lot of noise in the gradient anyway, we just take the sign of it and use that information only. Isn't that equivalent to rounding the gradients to a float, well, maybe not floating point, but a number system with just two, with just one sure. bit of precision? Yeah. Yeah. That's so that, true. Yeah. That's what I meant. You can just apply this with u equal to one half, I guess. Okay, got um, it. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Derek. Uh, and Alex. I think so. I kind of have two questions. The first one is you, you gave a nice demonstration that stochastic uh, rounding can improve the accuracy of computations. Uh, in terms of hardware, is, is it possible to uh, efficiently implement stochastic rounding in terms of hardware? There's uh, many literature quite recent on, on that topic. Um, there's, uh, there's a number of work on implementing in software, first of all, that can be relatively efficient. Um, there's a paper by Fazi and, and Miketis that uh, leverage uh, augmented operations to, to do that. Um, as for really uh, hardware support, uh, so far I believe it's limited, but it's maybe growing. Um, I've heard of the graph core units which um, support it. Um, I, I'm not sure there are many others, but I think given the, the results that stochastic grounding has, has shown in, in many important applications, I would expect hardware support to become more and more uh, widely available. And you made an interesting comment on this slide, which I didn't understand, which is uh, stochastic rounding also prevents stagnations in PDEs. Can you tell me more about what precisely that means? Yeah, so that, that's from a recent and, and very nice paper of Matteo Croci and, and Mike Gauss. Um, so in their paper, they focus on the heat equation. And um, since you still, part of a linear algebra computation in explicit solvers, and there is this uh, time step, right? Uh, that plays a big role. And when the, when the time step gets small, there's the, this chance of the, the, so the solution of the PDE just stagnating uh, because the, the subsequent updates are just not taken into account in, in low precision. Um, and so they have, they have a, an analysis that is focused on, on, on the heat equation in several dimensions. And, they show that stochastic grounding, uh, well, reduces the error bound by, by a significant factor. Okay, thank you very much for a nice talk. Thank you, Alex. So I, I just would like to ask a last question uh, to finish off. So as Aria, actually, I find uh, this probabilistic framework with the Martingales uh, really, uh, really intriguing. So where do you see this going from here? Well, I'd very much like to understand LU factorization better. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I, saw, uh, I showed that on the last slide. I, I'm really puzzled by that. Um, and there's, there's no reason to think that will happen because as I mentioned, we're not dealing here with random 
quantities. These are the LU factors of the matrix. So why, why are these computations so accurate? Um, so I think this is where I would devote uh, significant efforts, especially since, of course, linear systems and, and LU factorization is, is perhaps one of the most important algorithms in, in yes. computing. So yes. not understanding it perfectly is, is, yeah, is something we should change. Okay, super. Thank you so much.